For every hundred footballers like me who played serious football for a decade or so, out of every hundred, how many do you think will have what you call brain damage? And this guy said, and I'll never forget it, he said, 100%. You bastards knew and you put us out there. And this this kind of legal approach is what does actually change the culture. Certainly, I, I agree with you that we are now seeing a tipping point in the discussion about this injury. You know, the retired players come, that come into my lab, you know, do say that I feel like just a, nothing more than a commodity and, uh, you know, t- sort of almost devaluing them as human beings and, and being more just, you know, products for a, for a sport. Skiing over 6,000 days of my life, you start adding up and thinking, you know, there's probably pretty high numbers of, of multiple impacts that potentially could have an issue in the future. Welcome to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Onside, I'm Tim Gable. Well, today we're looking at the issue of concussion in sport. Our guests are former Wallaby author, prominent journalist and commentator Peter Fitzsimons, Dr Alan Pearce, Associate Professor at La Trobe University, and Dr Pearce is also the Research Manager of Sports Brain Bank Victoria, and Australia's fastest downhill skier, Paralympic legend Michael Milton. Uh, just a reminder, Sport Integrity Australia's Tokyo 2020 course has gone out to sports. As a wallaby, Peter Fitzsimons suffered concussion. In recent times, Peter has written extensively about concussion, including headed to the United States and speaking to a number of people on the issue there. And Peter is with us now. Uh, Peter, ha- how did you first become interested in, in the whole issue of concussion? I, we know that you've played for the Wallabies and, and very much a prominent journalist. How did you become involved and, and why did you take up this cause? I guess it really started with, in the age of the internet. It was suddenly easy to read the New York Times. And I guess 15 years ago or so, in reading the New York Times, I became more and more aware of how concussion was a serious issue in sport and that there were lots of NFL players particularly that were, to use the old terminology, punch drunk, which was like a revelation to many people because a lot of us were naive enough to think that it was only boxers that could suffer damage through concussion. And so I started reading a lot about that. But the big thing for me was in 2013, working for that... Channel 7 show, the Sunday night, uh, what was it called? Sunday night. And I went over to Virginia and then Boston, and I started in Virginia talking to brain experts and most particularly former linebackers and the widows of former linebackers and talking about their, their experiences with concussion. And it was shocking. And I, I the first guy I interviewed, his name was John Hilton, and he was 71, 72 years old. He looked like Charlton Heston, a physically beautiful man that was the most feared linebacker in America in the early 70s with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it was this wintry day, and he was in this retirement home, and he was, to use the old terminology, completely gaga. But he would have <clears throat> sort of lucid memories of what had happened and but then not realise who I was, what was happening. And then every now and then I'd say, so you played football. And he'd get out He'd get out from his wallet, you know, this uh, bubblegum card with John Hilton. And, and then he started talking about it. And then the doctor who was with me said, John, is it 1993, 2003 or 2013? He had no idea. But then the lucidity would return and he would talk about the brutality of his experience and then what had happened to other linebackers he'd played with and other footballers over the years who'd suicided gone mad etc and then he started crying and he said it was brutal it was brutal and here he was 50 years later 45 years later talking about the consequences and manifesting the consequences of getting your brain hit so badly and so I come away from that reeling and my next interview was with the foremost brain expert in America and I sort of shook his hand and said 
Look, uh, pleased to meet you. I've got to say, uh, I played a lot of football myself, and uh, I, I'm 50, 52 years old, And but I, I played a lot of football, but um, I wrote a best-selling book every year, so I guess I'm okay, am I? Hoping he would shake my hand and said, well, of course you're okay, but he didn't. He said, how old are you? I said, 52. And he said, no, no, well, we wouldn't know until you know, 10 years from now, a few years from now, we'll see how you are in your late 50s, early 60s, and then, then see how you go. And then I'm getting to the punchline. I interviewed him, cameras on, camera one on, camera two on, and I thought, I'll give this bastard another chance. So I said, look, I said, look, you know, for every hundred footballers like me who played serious football for a decade or so, out of every hundred, how many do you think will have what you call brain damage? And this guy said, and I'll never forget it, he said, one. 100%, 100%. Hundred percent, one hundred percent. And he, what he said was, and he was very evocative in his expression. He said, "Your brain is a bowl of jello, floating around in a bucket of bones, and it's meant to move around and sway around to Brahms, the music of Brahms, and you know, just a symphony, and just lightly and waving in the breeze, like a chrysanthemum on a spring day." It, what he said was, it's not meant to be going bam, 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 bam against the sides of your skull. And if it does go like that, bam, bam, against the sides of your skull, he said, there'll be damage. And you know, don't, don't, yeah. don't kid yourself, there will be damage. And part of the process with Channel 7, my producer not unreasonably said, well, Peter, given you know, you've had so many concussions – or concussive impacts, it would be good for the uh, show if you would take the brain test to see what damage is done. And I said, no, I won't, because I was so shocked (laughs) by the whole thing, and I followed it ever since. And what you see now, you know, there's been huge progress with most of the football, well, most of the codes, contact codes with protocols, which is great. What needs to be done, however, is an observation of said protocols so that when somebody goes down, you don't go through the nonsense. When you see somebody, particularly in rugby league, which is where it's most flagrant, you see people clearly concussed, clearly gaga, still getting HIAs, head injury assessments, which is, you know, let's see if they're concussed or not. And then so often they come back, you know, on the field or more last year than this year, no, no, okay, there's no problem with the head, to which I have written many times. Oh, really? No problem? What the hell was it? Was it flu? Was it a bad cold? Can you tell us what it was, why he was wobbling at the knees and wandering all over the place? But you've done the head injury assessment, so it wasn't concussion. What the hell was it? And I'll tell you, Tim, we will see those cases show up in court 10 years from now. Yes, you have writ- written about the, the mixed messages on concussion a, a number of times, you know, players passing an HIA, cleared to return, in some cases, sometimes not. Uh, you've got experts disagreeing with those at the front line. There's a certain amount of scepticism. We really need to be on the on the same page, don't we? Absolutely. And it's the law that's moving it forward. You know, in America, you, it was not taken seriously for many years, many decades, until I think the first case was... $800 million class action, and then they went back and said, no, one point, I don't have the figures in front of me, but there was serious money that changed hands. And the essence of the reason why money changed hands was the footballers quite reasonably saying, you bastards knew. You knew what this was doing to our brains, and yet you still sent us out there. You still you put us out there week after week. We suffered brain damage because of what you did. So one of the things I say to the football codes is I was, for example, playing for the Wallabies against the French in 1990 at Sydney Football Stadium. I was knocked completely cold in the first two minutes. So no names, no pack drill, but it was Terry Devergy that hit me <laughs> to start the brawl. And then Philippe Seller hit me from behind. I went down like a sack of spuds and I was knocked cold for a minute and I woke up singing Bob Dylan. And I then went on to play the game of my life. I was so infuriated by what had happened. Now, I was concussed. I played on. I, for example, would have no legal case against the ARU or the team doctor or the coach because I I didn't know, and in 1990, 
they didn't know, you know, that 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 footballers could – there was a real danger of second impact syndrome on concussion. It was if you could wake up and they threw the water over you and you were magic sponge, you were ready to go. And I played on and I was fine. But now when you have players that go down – and they're still put back out there. One of the things I say to the CEOs of the of the codes is now you're playing for your lives. And I put a thing in the paper the other day that for the footballers, you need to know the virtues of a contemporaneous note. If you are knocked out and a trainer or a coach or an assistant coach or anybody says to you anything along the lines of don't tell anybody you're concussed, you'll be fine, just get back up quickly where it's fine, or don't say to the press that you you, you were gaga, you know, just just say you're fine and you, you hurt your hip and you'll be back out there. Anybody says anything to you like that, take a contemporaneous note because it'll be valuable 15, 20 years from now if you develop brain malfunctions and, and stuff. And so we had another, we had another issue um, which was really – Profoundly shocking for me in November uh, last year. I spoke at a. I was asked to appear at a symposium for Macquarie University where they were doing a brain trauma episode. And I, I didn't know anything about it. I just said, just come and interview a couple of people as the cameras roll. So I go in, and there is this guy. There is this people come into the room and they set the cameras up. And there was a fellow, a boxer by the name of Dexter, nice bloke, and a bloke I'd never met before with his wife and his his name was Michael Lipson and I looked it up and he played 11 I think 11 times for England he's an Australian born man played on the flank for England uh, 11 times but you know had also played two or 300 games of professional rugby with his wife nice woman by the name of Frances who I couldn't help but notice had haunted eyes I thought what what's going on here why is she looking you know sort of upset haunted anyway so cameras roll and the story comes out of Michael, the 40-year-old, 40, 41-year-old 41 now, but but they'd gone, he'd had mood swings, he couldn't remember things, um, he couldn't, he, he, he was erratic behaviour and, and particular explosions of temper out of the blue. And she said, so we got him tested, and the cameras are rolling, and we got him tested, and the answer came back, mild dementia. And she said... Mm. And he was 40 years old. And so I go, I, I was just shocked. And the camera stopped rolling. I go home and I wrote to them, to both of them, and said, look, the cameras were rolling. The Herald protocol is when you speak with the cameras rolling, we are, you know, the Herald, Sydney Morning Herald, if I'm interviewing you, Tim, and yep. this is an interview situation and you say it into my tape recorder, I own it. I said, but this was not like that. This was a symposium. This was not a journalistic herald thing. So I'm telling you, what you said there is explosive. I would like to put it in the herald, but understand that if I put it in the herald, you know, this will be 40-year-old international football player, has mild dementia through too many concussions, understand what you're doing. She said, let us both think about it, came back 24 hours later, said, well, this is our experience. This is what happened to put it in the paper. And they did put it in the paper and the world did go crazy. And then Michael, is, who's a nice fellow, by the way, um, and she's a wonderful support to him. But I think they're part of a class action from memory. I think it's 110 rugby union players in England taking the English football union to court. And the basic theme is you bastards knew and you put us out there. And this this kind of legal approach is what does actually change the culture. Yes, yeah, so Michael Lippman, I think you wrote in your story. That's it. Did I say Lippman? Lippman, yes. Yeah. Yes, was knocked out 30 times. Uh, you, yeah, also, you, also, yeah, you also said that it was very much the tip of the iceberg, didn't you? Well, if you've got a 40-year-old that's going down with that, with that, and then I went back, um, I think it was a while later, because they continue to do this. Steve Roach has also talked about his problems, and and uh, Steve Roach is now working as a football commentator, but he's honest enough to say he was knocked out many times in the 80s as a footballer, and he's developing problems now, and he's getting help. Jeff Fennick has also talked about that. And I, in that same episode that I was up there, doing that, I went next door where the footballers, where, where there were a bunch of guys, former league players, union players, boxers, talking about their experiences. And it was, again, quite shocking that you had, frequently they came with their families and you had these guys 
that were good guys but in real trouble, in real trouble. And then you had the families and it was just like it was when I was in America talking to the widows of the linebackers that were talking about their experience. And there was my friend. I was coached by a fellow called Barry Taylor, Tizza Taylor his name was, and he was not a great footballer. He was a pretty good coach. He was my Australian under-21s coach, but he played a lot of football for Manly on the flank, and he was always getting into scraps, always on the bottom of the ruck, always getting knocked out, and he'd done a bit of boxing, I think, early on. Anyway, to cut to the chase, Tizza, at the age of 57 or 58, late 50s, had shocking mood swings, diagnosed with dementia, outbursts of anger, temper, and his son, Stephen, told me, you know, I had to hold Dad down. They finally get him into an institution, and he finally dies at the age of 70, 71. And it was, with the greatest respect, a blessing for all concerned because the man we knew as Tizza had left 10 years ago. And anyway, after it happened, I called his lovely widow, Enid, and said, look, Enid, I've been working with the Brain Bank in Boston and what they need in situations like this, if there's a suspected CTE, which is the condition associated with too many concussions, which is a brain disease, they need to extract the brain within 48 hours of death and get it get it to get it to Boston where they can analyse it. So I'm, this is a strange phone call, but I'm asking you, could we arrange to extract Tizza's brain? get it in an ice bucket and send it to Boston. And she said, okay. So they did. And the analysis came back. And it gave the family closure. The analysis came back. It was one of the worst five brains they'd ever seen. Mm. And it was riddled with CTE. And so for the family, it gave you – know, I'm not quite comfortable using words like closure because it can descend into psychobabble. But it gave them an understanding of the experience they had been through as a family, why their devoted husband and father of the family had behaved in this manner. It wasn't him. It was – it's suffering from too many concussions. And people say, well, do you say football should be shut down? Absolutely not. But concussion protocols have to be observed. All kids have to be raised on the mantra of, if in doubt, sit it out. And the professional football codes have to get serious about observing the protocols. Just as a final question, given that you, as you've pointed out, suffered a head knock, quite a, a bad one, uh, given that you were knocked out. Are you, are you worried about your future of course, yeah. of course. But what I say to my doctor, and I've, I've, I've shared my concerns with my doctor, and what he says and gives me some encouragement, a lot of encouragement, he's, when I'm on a flight to London, back in the days before the plague descended, I would fly to Europe fairly regularly. And on a 23-hour flight, I like to work for about 16 or 17 hours because I find in doing the books that I do, the time in the air is just fantastic because I've got no interruptions and I can just work. And what he says to me is if you can work 16, 17 hours in a, in a time span of 24 hours, and I don't do that often, but only on flights, but he says if you're capable of that level of sustained concentration, you'll be fine. And I take that as encouragement. It still worries me. My wife Something else sort of guess helps me. Okay, when I, I do occasionally lose my train of thought, but it also happens to my wife, and she didn't play a lot of football at all. Okay. Yes, uh, lovely woman, Lisa. Thanks very much for joining us, Peter. Um, it, it's been a great insight. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Tim. Associate Professor at La Trobe University, Dr. Alan Pearce, is the Research Manager of Sports Brain Bank Victoria. And Dr. Pearce has been involved in extensive research into the issue of concussion. Well, Alan, uh, at last, sports seem to be taking it seriously, but um, it's taken a while and there is still a fair bit of confusion about exactly what constitutes concussion and whether or not it does lead to uh, some degenerative disease when it comes to mental health. We, we're still in the dark to a certain degree about this, or do you think that we're heading in the right direction? Well, I, I certainly think that we're heading in the right direction. Uh, the emerging evidence worldwide is very clear that there are um, you know, links between repeated head trauma and that's either with, you know, repeated concussions or what we call sub-concussions where uh, the brain receives impacts but you don't see the uh, the, the obvious signs of, of concussion per se. 
um, and what we we do see from the uh, you know the international research is that there are links now to uh, a range of of uh, uh, diseases um, and cognitive impairments. So some of the diseases include Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, and obviously the most well discussed is is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Do you think sports are taking it seriously? Well, I guess you can say that they are now. <laughs> um, they weren't up until probably about five years ago, and certainly in the last 18 months when, um, you know, we announced Polly Farmer and then more recently Danny Frawley and uh, Shane Tuck's uh, CTE diagnoses that the sports have really now starting to take the issue much, much more seriously. And you can see that with their policy changes and their management changes of concussion. Um, but there's still this, and I don't understand really myself, uh, you know, some hesitancy on whether, you know, the, the long-term outcomes, as, as you uh, asked previously, you know, the research we see is so clear, but uh, there, there's still some hesitancy to to accept the, the science. The protocols that sports adopt, um, there is no uniform protocol, and that possibly is part of the issue here in that, that sports, uh, you know, really aren't doing enough in terms of protocols to, to ensure that the issue is sort of to a certain degree managed properly. Yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, interesting point you make. I mean, uh, the con- concussion in, in sport group have, you know, a, a fair amount of a consensus on what needs to be done, but the sports seem to add their own flavour to it. <laughs> and so you do see some disparity between the different sports and what they do and what they don't do. Um, but for me, you know, part of it is the fact that we need to have more objective markers that can actually tell or give the doctors confidence on uh, what they're seeing um, from their clinical judgment. And I think once we start to in- include more objective biomarkers, and that could be blood, saliva, uh, brain stimulation, which is what I do in my research, um, I think we might f- hopefully find uh, more um, uh, uniform uh, approaches to uh, return to play guidelines in particular. Part of the issue too is that players often lie because they, they want to stay on the field. They don't want to let their teammates down. And so they tend to say, no, I'm fine. It wasn't a head knock. Is that part of the issue here? Oh, very much. It's it's that cultural, uh, dare I say, hyper-masculine um, response to the invisible injury. And so unlike, you know, a knee injury or an Achilles, ruptured Achilles, where it's so obvious that the 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 athlete is injured uh, with concussion. You know, it's it's a brain injury that is hidden inside the skull. So, uh, what we're limited to at the moment is symptom reporting um, or symptom observation. And so, athletes who have been, I guess, uh, trained for you know many decades. You know, if you take them from this from from juniors right through to professional levels, to to not show weakness, to not show pain. So, for them to say oh, actually, I think I might be concussed because I'm feeling a little bit dizzy, almost goes against what they've been trained psychologically to to aim for at the elite level. So uh, what we need to do is not only educate athletes, but we actually have to change the culture around uh, this injury and it's, you know, and have a, a, a almost a, some of my colleagues in, in the UK call it a psychological safe space in order for athletes to be able to speak up with confidence that they're not going to be deselected later on or they're not going to be seen as weak or letting their teammates down. And and also having their teammates actually say, oh, look, you know, um, you know, my teammate looks concussed. I think you need to go and check him or her out. Um, and, and, and that is okay as well because uh, the long-term ramifications – um, you know, can be so devastating. Is there an integrity issue at stake here in, in terms of sports and safeguarding and the protection of their athletes? Do you think that that is worth having a look at as well, the, the integrity aspect of this? Oh, without a doubt. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, we have to, and the, and the you know, the retired players come, that come into my lab, you know, do say that I feel like just a, nothing more than a commodity and, uh, you know, t- sort of almost devaluing them as human beings and, and being more just, uh, you know, products for a, for a sport. And so I think there is certainly an integrity issue here because we have to look after the, 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 the key component of these professional sports um, and they're, not, they're just not entertaining playthings. And so I think it's very important that we need to take that uh, aspect of, of the uh, 
of the issue as well. Because in America, for instance, we have seen NFL players have class actions uh, legally and suing the NFL uh, for damage done to their brains through repeated concussions. And it would seem the bottom line is, is really driving a lot of this at the moment. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and that wouldn't have been done without the actual science showing that there was, you know, uh, these players having uh, CTE post-mortem. And I think that was the real game changer because up till then it was still very much, well, you know, uh, we don't know if the players are just, you know, not uh, have got some other issues, you know, being alcohol or drug related, and and we can't, you know, tease out these other issues. But but certainly uh, the pathology doesn't lie, and and so I think that's changed a lot of the the conversation around what is happening to our athletes that um, make um, you know make our sports so exciting. Alan, you're the Victorian manager of the Australian Sports Brain Bank. Can you tell us about that? And and I understand a number of former sports people have actually told you, listen, we'd like to donate our brains to the Sports uh, uh, Brain Bank. Can you tell us a bit about the Brain Bank? Yeah, so the uh, <clears throat> the Australian Sports Brain Bank uh, started in mid-2018 by Associate Professor Michael Buckland at uh, the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and the Mind uh, and Brain Centre. Um, and he's a he's a neuropathologist, and um, I guess from from him setting up the the brain bank, it was a I guess for me it was it was the next step because I'd been I, I have been doing uh, concussion research for nearly twelve years now, but uh, showing physiological changes isn't quite enough, and having the pathology supporting the physiology. Uh, has been a real help for me. And so uh, what this has done now is is, is uh, alerted a lot of athletes who have sort of thought and their families have thought maybe something's not quite right. We, we need to, uh, to think about this uh, more seriously. And so being the Victorian manager, um, I sort of liaise with a lot of the Australian football players. Um, Michael being up in Sydney, obviously he gets the, the rugby league and the rugby union players inquiries. Uh, but, uh, you know, having having a Melbourne-Sydney collaboration certainly allows us to, uh, to cut across all the codes that are um, affected by this. All right. So a couple of recommendations I noticed that you've made and other people in this space have made uh, a limit on full contact training, uh, possibly 14 days, sometimes 30 days before players are allowed back on the field. How successful do you think you're going to be in getting these guidelines implemented? Well, um, you know, we never thought that we'd get 12 day stand down um, with the AFL until this year. Um, so, I, you know, it's all about small steps and it's all about changing the attitude in the wider community to concussion and, and sub-concussions, um, taking the injury more seriously. Um, and so, you know, we, we still keep calling uh, for changes because we know that, uh, you know, the long-term welfare will pay off in the end. The, the, ash, the you know, the, the one of the things that we do want to see is modifications to the sport in particularly with junior players because we know that exposure to repeated trauma is is a is a is a risk factor for CTE um, and so we don't want the stop we don't want to stop the sport so I guess that's that's one of the things that is mis misconstrued about what we're calling for all we're asking for just like tennis they have modified equipment to protect the shoulders of, of kids uh, baseball have a what they call a pitch count so they, again they they protect the the kids uh shoulders and and i think even with cricket you know the Osgood slaters with the knee um injury uh you know there are there are limitations here so why not for brain health as well why can't we get kids to be able to learn how to play the sport um enjoy the sport but just not have the experience trauma to the head until at least 12 years of age, if not 14. Just on that uh, that uh, topic, one question that constantly gets asked is, uh, does headgear provide adequate protection? <laughs> What's your view on that? <laughs> yeah, uh, if, if I could get a, a buck for every one of those questions, I'd, I'd probably self-fund my research now. Um, it is it is the one of the biggest myths in concussion that helmets will protect the brain from being concussed. And uh, and the reason for that is because um, the brain sits in a sac of fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid, but also the brain itself is very delicate tissue. It's not it's not 
fixed like you see in biology classes when you dissect a, a lamb's brain. It's it's very soft. So even when you're wearing a helmet and you, you get an impact, the, the force is still transmitted through to the brain tissue. So while a helmet can protect the skull bone from fracturing or lacerations, you know, and I ride a bike, I, I, I wear a helmet knowing that it's protecting my skull, but I do know that it's not going to protect me from concussion because the, the brain tissue still moves. And if that moves violently enough from an impact, that's where you start to see the disruption in the brain cells working and therefore you see, uh, you know, the, the, the signs and symptoms of concussion. So very much um, it's on the outside, protective headgear on the inside, things get shaken up and um, that leads to concussion. So uh, you, you watch players on the football field, for instance, wearing headgear really offers just the outside protection rather than the, the protection inside. That's correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just a, just as a final question, do you feel as though it, it is moving at a rapid pace at the moment and people are sort of still trying to catch up. You mentioned there a moment ago, Polly Farmer, Shane Tuck, Danny Frawley. We're seeing cases now that are coming into the news. Is it happening fast enough for your liking that this, I guess, evidence coming out and, and people mm. responding to change? Um, yes, I th but I still think that the science is lagging. Um, you know, science takes time to be able to, uh, to actually analyse and interpret the evidence, whereas I think the wider discussion driven by the media is outpacing that. So one of the concerns I do have is that there is a level of anxiety um, with parents and, and people who, you know, generally in the community that we shouldn't be playing these sports at all. And I think that's not what we're about. We're, we're about trying to make the sport safer. Um, but certainly I, I agree with you that we are now seeing a tipping point in the discussion about this injury and it's not something that can be just hidden away or, or devalued or, or um, humorised as getting a, you know, bell rung. Um, and, and so people are now taking it more seriously. We just need to get more independently funded research uh, to really fully understand, you know, what is the rate of CTE in football? We don't know the, those questions yet. Um, you know, what are the differences between male and female concussions? What are the differences in or, or the effects of uh, rugby and Australian football on kids' brains? Because most of our data is coming from America right now. So there's plenty of uh, questions that we still have to answer. All right, Alan. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Fascinating discussion and it, it is one that really is captivating and also, I guess, to a certain degree, um, providing a bit of a, a sobering context to sport at the moment as we, uh, as we progress forward. Thanks very much for your time. No problems. Thanks for having me on. You're listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Well, it's not just contact sports that are impacted by concussion. Michael Milton is Australia's most successful winter Paralympian, winning six gold medals, three silver and two bronze medals. He competed in events such as the Giant Slalom, the Downhill, the Super G. And Michael also holds the record for the Australian Downhill Speed Skiing record, the speed of 213 kilometres an hour. And he joins us on the program. Now, uh, Michael, obviously, you know, you have a look at some of the events that you're involved in. Uh, you'd think that, well, concussion head knocks would be a, a fact of life there. You know, you're always going to have crashes as an athlete when you're pushing your limits, when you're trying new things, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to crash. And that's fact of life. And for, I guess, um, you know, the way you crash from kind of a, a whiplashy type effect, if you might spin backwards in the air and, and land on your bum and, and then kind of have your head hitting the ground, um, there's always going to be those sort of things in a sport like skiing. What about you? Have you been impacted by it yourself? I've certainly had plenty of, I guess, what I would call a head knock um, throughout my career. Um, you know, a couple of times been loss of consciousness and stuff. I've never been diagnosed with concussion and never kind of seen some of those classic symptoms that, that you get from concussion, that kind of, you know, the nausea, the vomiting, um, some of those sort of things. And probably, um, you know, when I did get a head knock, even when I was knocked out and stuff, um, you know, it was probably, a, you know, um, go sit in a restaurant for an hour and, and see how you feel. And if you think you're up for training, then go back out and do it. 
Is it fair to say that if you're doing it in the current day and you suffered what you call back then head knocks, it would be diagnosed as concussion because you, you did lose consciousness and, you know, that seems to be sort of part of the criteria these days? Yeah, certainly there's, there's um, you know, that sort of evaluation. Um, I guess, um, you know, the other the other side of things um, in sport, um, you know, during my time was probably a bit less medical support. So if you're overseas with the team, um, you might not have um, access to a team doctor. Um, and that means using local doctors and making appointments and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I, I would think that most times these days there would be a medical assessment um, pretty much straight away. And, um, you know, a little bit of time off the hill, um, you know, complete rest, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the way that would be managed um, now would be quite different. Uh, have you been reading up on all these cases that are happening at the moment, people coming out and saying, listen, later in life it has impacted quite severely on me, I'm getting depression, I'm um, having mental ill health issues. Do you, do you have a look at that and, and sort of take notice of, of what's happening in terms of some of the research that is coming out? Yeah, I guess I've done a little bit of concussion type training um while working as a coach with the australian winter paralympic team and i guess you know certainly when um these sort of things come up in the media you hear about different stories my ears prick up and i listen and i go you know i'm i'm definitely not at high risk for these sort of things but it's it's certainly a concern um going forwards that that you know um there there was just you know just so many. I mean, you know, when I start to think about um, skiing over 6,000 days of my life, probably averaging, a, you know, a crash um, at least once a day, um, you know, you start adding up and thinking, you know, there's probably um, pretty high numbers of, of multiple impacts that, that potentially could have an issue in the future. Uh, did you wear a helmet all the time, even at training? Certainly, um, probably early in my career, um, helmets were a bit more optional. Um, and throughout my career, helmet kind of became um, an everyday piece of equipment that was that was automatically there. But again, even even things, you know, I remember having the same helmet for nearly five years, and those sort of um, you know the protocol for helmet replacement um, post impact, etc., would be quite different now. When you were skiing, and I mentioned just a moment ago that the world skiing, the Australian ski, sorry, I mentioned just a moment ago the Australian skiing record with a speed of 213 kilometres an hour as well as the downhill, the, the Super G, etc. Did you have in the back of your mind, um, you know, I hope I don't get a head knock here? Was that a factor? Because I'd imagine, you know, there would be a certain amount of fear, but was there a factor that, gee, I hope I don't uh, knock myself out here? Um, you know, I think um, when, you, when you're doing a sport like skiing, when you are, um, you know, speeds commonly well over 100 kilometres an hour in a downhill, um, including turns, jumps, bumps, et cetera, um, you know, you're probably a bit more specifically thinking about a, an injury, a crash, than a specific, um, you know, head impact. And um, so, yeah, those sort of things are, are always on your mind and it's a big part of sport being able to have – uh, I guess that kind of mental ability to go, hey, what I'm doing is risky. I could hurt myself. I could even kill myself. Um, but um, it's something that I'm highly motivated to do. And, and if I'm going to do it to this level, I need to be able to push those kind of thoughts to the back of your mind and be able to um, push hard and take risks and, and um, you know, kind of almost ignore those risks in some ways. At a later stage in your life now, do you, do you still take those risks? <laughs> later stage in life, um, you know, I'm not quite 50 yet, but, um, yeah, certainly, you know, I have a personality profile that, that is a bit of a risk taker. And, um, you know, I think as you get older, some of that gets mitigated, but at the same time, I'm the same person and, um, you know, I – enjoy going out and doing things you know um certainly yeah i'm i'm, I'm yeah I, I have that personality definitely are you, are you concerned about you know the impact that some of those head knocks you mentioned there just a huge number of crashes that you, you've had over the years are you worried about the future at all you know when you when you do a sport like skiing you know you kind of you know 
particularly when you're young, um, very passionate about what you do and, and highly motivated, you don't think so much about long-term Im- term impacts. Um, as you get older, I think it's very natural for those thoughts to come in. So, um, you know, if I've had cancer twice, um, I probably worry a bit more about in terms of my long-term health, those sort of things more than um, – you know any impacts that are that might be from multiple head in, head knocks and impacts and potential concussions. So um, yeah, um, yeah, I worry about my health in the future. I you know I see my parents going through health issues and go you know I don't want to get old. Um, and the risk profile for me might be slightly higher, but um, you know that's. Uh, it's another thing as an athlete that you get taught you uh, you don't worry about the things you can't control you worry about the things you can control and you know I can't control what I've done in the past just have a look at uh, I guess uh, a lot of the publicity these days seems to be around head knocks in contact sports such as football not too much about what happens with other sports such as roller derby or or downhill skiing uh, do you think there should be more focus on on some of those other sports I think in the public eye and the media, um, that might be the case. Obviously, a sport, you know, the football codes, are, are, you know, in terms of public interest and stuff is massive and some of the other sports are, are less so. Um, it's my belief that uh, within the sporting community itself, the training of coaches, um, medical staff, athletes themselves um, is probably a little bit more relevant to that than than the public interest. So, uh, you know, I think certainly the way things are managed have changed over the years. And, um, you know, I think it's it's probably more important for for those people involved in the sport to have education and understanding. Yeah. No, well, well spoken, Michael. Uh, thanks very much for joining us on Onside today, and uh, all the best. Uh, sounds like you're, you're not slowing down. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us on Onside. Thank you, Tim. And now for our segment from Left Field, where we answer a question from the public. Hey everyone, my name's Haley. I'm an Australian swimmer. My question from Left of Field today is: Do repeat offenders face tougher sanctions? This is determined on a case-by-case basis. However, sanctions can range from a reprimand all the way through to a lifetime ban. And historically, repeat offenders have received tougher sanctions. Well, thanks for listening to Onside. I'm Tim Gable. Thank you also to our guests, Peter Fitzsimons, Dr. Alan Pearce and Michael Milton. And we'll continue to cover issues that relate to integrity in sport. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website www.sportintegrity.gov.au or check out our Clean Sport app.